Welcome to Vision 2020 USA's telehealth interview series. Yao Lu, MD, MS, is the chair of the American Telemedicine Association Ocular Telehealth SIG, the director of the UW Teleophthalmology Program, and an assistant professor in the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. She is interviewed by Rajiv from Chandran, MD, MBA, Associate Professor of Ophthalmology at the Flam Eye Institute at the University of Rochester, and a member of Vision 2020 USA. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, I am Rajiv Ramchandran. I am an ophthalmologist, uh, Victor Retinal Surgeon at the University of Rochester and Associate Professor of Ophthalmology. I'm also a member at large at Provision 2020. And today we have the great fortune of interviewing Dr. Yao Lu, who is Associate Professor of Ophthalmology at the University of Wisconsin in Madison and also Director of Teleophthalmology at the University of Ma uh, Madison, uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison. So welcome, Yao, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks so much, Rajiv. I really appreciate the opportunity. Great. So, you know, teleophthalmology is a, a word um, that has been uh, used more often in the last uh, decade or so with uh, a lot of uh, interest in telemedicine. And uh, you and I both have dabbled in this area and uh, done great work to help the community um, you, um, you know, are, are, are leading a, a group uh, not only at the University of Wisconsin, but also nationally as um, part of the American Telemedicine Association. Can you tell us a little bit about that role as well? Sure. Um, so the American Telemedicine Association uh, is the largest organization dedicated to telemedicine uh, in the country, and we are very fortunate to put out national guidelines on a regular basis for uh, practice uh, patterns for uh, things like diabetic eye disease. And this year, we've actually expanded to include uh, teleglaucoma, artificial intelligence, and uh, retinopathy of prematurity and macular degeneration. Great. So it's uh, great to see that teleophthalmology and telemedicine in general is expanding definitely this year um, uh, because um, we really needed it because of the pandemic and not able to uh, provide direct care to many of our patients. Um, has that been something that's been going on in the University of Wisconsin too and in, in your uh, field there? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously telemedicine is a, a hot topic these, this, uh, these days, so I'll just start with just a quick definition. So uh, in terms of teleophthalmology, we typically refer to that as the use of any telecommunications technology that make it easier for people to get high-quality eye care in their local communities. And obviously this year we've had a lot, a huge increase in that um, with real-time programs, which allow the patient and the eye care provider to interact directly with each other at the same time through either video or phone-based platforms uh, related to limitations from COVID-19 pandemic. Um, some of the more traditional programs uh, are uh, what we call store and forward. And an example of that, um, I'll describe our program here at the University of Wisconsin, where we use retinal cameras located in rural primary care clinics to take photos for patients with diabetes. Those uh, images are then sent electronically and reviewed by specialists 70 miles away to check for patients um, with diabetic eye disease, and a report gets sent back to the patient and primary care provider, similar to how a radiologist interprets an x-ray or an ultrasound. Any patients needing additional in-person eye care or evaluation or treatment are then rapidly identified and brought into care with their local eye doctors. Uh, the great thing about diabetic eye screening is this is a system that's been well validated and used for decades in the VA health system, um, where the images are taken, stored, and then forwarded to the eye care provider. So that's a great use of uh, storm forward technology too. And now with the pandemic, I know that uh, many ophthalmology providers are, are providing care real time. Can you talk a little bit about that as well? Sure. Um, you know, real time or virtual care uh, previous to COVID-19 was relatively uncommon here in the U.S. And uh, many eye care providers have been providing uh, this op option as an alternative to in-person exams, uh, including for multiple eye care subspecialties uh, during COVID-19. It's been a bit of a challenge um, in that uh, checking basic things like visual acuity can be challenging through virtual platforms 
Uh, also, it's not uh, too easy, um, although still feasible to check pressure. Some um, patients have uh, purchased in-home uh, tenometry uh, uh, um, devices or rent them. Uh, also, some practices offer uh, drive-through uh, eye care um, uh, tenometry checks uh, in their car um, for patients. So there are a lot of different um, ways in which people are now offering, uh, you know, this sort of virtual care um, where the patient would then talk to the eye care provider at a later date. Sometimes that testing is still done in the eye care, uh, in the eye clinic, um, but then the encounter with the um, clinician is actually done later. I see. So how does that work with home tenometry? Has that been uh, something that patients can use? Yeah, so um, there have been a few papers that have shown that patients are able to reliably perform home tenometry using uh, devices um, that do not require the installation of um, drops for um, uh, uh, to numb the eye. And um, those have been pretty promising. It does take a, a good bit of um, training and practice on the part of the patient. And there's still a lot um, that we haven't figured out in terms of um, how best to utilize that technology and in what setting. Yeah, definitely. I know that there's uh, some pediatric ophthalmologists who have also been using telemedicine in a real-time format to look for strabismus and to assess vision and look for amblyopia in children. So definitely there's a lot of scope in doing this and maybe even uh, more public health screenings for children in that regard as well. So in terms of practice, um, how do you think teleophthalmology, you know, is, is going to be used in our practice as ophthalmologists and also in engaging with non-ophthalmologists in the larger public community that exists? How does it help to expand the access to eye care? Sure. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, some of the most established programs for teleophthalmology involves screening for diabetic eye disease in primary care clinics and screening for retinopathy of prematurity in neonatal intensive care units. Uh, there's also an increasing number of these types of store and forward programs focusing on comprehensive eye care and glaucoma. Uh, the expansion of these technologies to non-traditional settings uh, will be really important. Um, for example, primary care practices and pharmacies where um, patients are often visiting frequently, um, it's great to be able to offer eye care in a very convenient location. And for example, 90% of patients with diabetes regularly see their uh, primary care provider, but only about half are seeing their, their eye care provider. So providing high quality eye care in convenient locations will allow us to reach more patients who don't have easy access to eye care. So it's all about quick, easy, and convenient. That convenience is so key, um, and also cost. And that's I think that's also another thing that we have to uh, consider. But in all of these technologies, one of the things you know, as an ophthalmologist and as an eye care provider, that I really look to is the quality. Now, if there are going to be non eye care folks who are going to be involved in the process of taking images, um, how do we ensure the quality of these images and the quality of care we're providing? when it's no longer in the realms of the eye care provider anymore? It's a great question. Um, the quality of imaging, fortunately, with a lot of these newer cameras can be very high. Uh, in addition, um, many of these cameras offer autofocus and auto capture uh, functions with easy to use touch screens that enable imagers to take high quality images with minimal training. Uh, we've actually provided free camera, camera demonstrations at rural health fairs where our technician's 11-year-old granddaughter took all the images and did a fantastic job. Um, and as you mentioned, the convenience factor is really important for patients. It often takes less than 5 or 10 minutes to obtain the photos. Dilating drops are usually not needed, and many patients describe their experience as being quick, easy, and painless. Uh, we'll be excited to continue to see image quality improve with the development of uh, newer and more affordable cameras. Great. And, and what about dilation? You brought the fact that a lot of cameras don't require dilations or non midriatic, but is dilation still involved in, in doing teleophthalmology? 
So some programs will dilate all their patients. Um, what we found is that uh, not having to use dilating drops is a big uh, patient uh, satisfier, and it actually gets more people to uh, obtain screening. I would say that um, some uh, places like the VA and Indian Health Service have instituted a dilation as needed protocol. So, for example, the uh, technician would attempt to take photos without dilation, and if the images, the image quality is not adequate, uh, they can instill uh, a half strength or 0.5 percent trypticamide uh, in a patient's eyes, um, and that usually gets the pupil size large enough um, once it gets around three millimeters or so to uh, take advantage of that uh, and be able to get high quality images with these newer cameras. That's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, dilation is still something that may have to be done, but for a majority of uh, folks, hopefully not. And this is a great uh, overcoming of a great barrier that exists in delivering care. I know many of my patients are like, oh my God, doc, how long am I going to be dilated for or blurry for after they see me? As a retina specialist, I dilate everybody, right? So it's a, it's a very different thing when you don't have to have that and you still can get some eye care. Um, one of the things that I know um, that a lot of people People that ask for patients ask for at least in my my program is they're always come in thinking they're going to get glasses when they come in and get their teleophthalmology um, eye um, evaluation. Now, what do you what do you think about that? What what what, what would have what has your experience been as far as what patients expect out of it? Well, I think that um, making sure that the patient education materials are really clear about what the purpose of the screening is and also providing that education to the primary care providers and the staff that are um, telling the patients about what to expect. So um, it's kind of a joke, but um, on the presentation that I usually give to the primary care providers and the primary care staff, um, I have a slide that basically it says, you know, here are the things you should tell patients what to expect. And the last sentence says, we will not prescribe glasses. And then, you know, you know, the top three things I write, we will not prescribe glasses. Number two, we will not prescribe glasses. And number three, we will not prescribe glasses. So we really try to hit home that that's not the goal because I do think that's a really common misconception. And one of the factors that really contributes to confusion among patients is they may go and get glasses somewhere but not have had a dilated exam and they assume that they had diabetic eye screening. That's true. Patient education is so key, and you hit the, uh, one of the key points there is understanding what constitutes an eye exam, right? And so that's really, really important, especially folks with diabetes, the importance of looking at the back of the eye and the retina and looking for disease that we're doing with these programs and in other diseases too, including glaucoma as well. So do you think that the teleophthalmology that it currently exists and currently being deployed is improving access to care? Um, is this something that's really working? Well, the short answer is yes. We know that teleophthalmology can greatly expand access to eye care. And let's stay with diabetic eye disease as our example. Teleophthalmology has shown to be cost effective and has reduced blindness from diabetes in single payer health systems such as the VA and the English National Health Service, where diabetic eye screening rates exceed 80%. And remarkably, diabetes is no longer the leading cause of certifiable blindness, certifiable blindness in England following the national rollout of their program. Um, we've known for 50 years that the majority of blindness from diabetes is completely preventable with early detection and treatment, but diabetes remains the leading cause of blindness among working-age U.S. adults, largely from lack of access to screening and treatment. And we know that teleophthalmology can close this gap if it becomes more widely adopted and uh, effectively implemented. So what are your views about the adoption of teleophthalmology in non-eye care settings? You know, um, what, what have been the facilitators and the, and the barriers for, for making this happen? Yes, unfortunately, teleophthalmology use in the U.S. remains very limited, and uh, there are major barriers uh, to adoption, particularly in multi-payer health systems uh, outside the VA, uh, outside of um, uh, you know, some health systems where you have uh, basically um, integration of the uh, insurer and the healthcare system. Um, so where the majority of patients receive care are considered multi-payer health systems. And some of the major barriers include financial concerns, uh, limited use by providers, staff, and patients. Um, I know we focus a lot on costs um, as a 
uh, a major barrier that's often cited for patients. Um, but, uh, you know, cost is not the major barrier. We know from a prior randomized clinical trial that, uh, you know, even when patients were offered this technology at no cost, uh, they were not able to sustain increases in a multi-payer system um, in uh, diabetic eye screening. Um, so, so patient cost is, is only part of the equation. Some of the possible ways to overcome the barriers include more affordable camera technology, demonstrating a variety of financially sustainable billing models for health systems, and engaging key stakeholders such as patients, primary care providers, uh, eye care providers, uh, clinical and health systems administrators, insurers, and health policymakers to maximize top ophthalmology use. Um, another area that um, hasn't really had as much focus is in follow-up rates for in-person eye care among patients who are detected to have vision-threatening eye disease on their teleophthalmology imaging. Uh, that has been reported to be quite low in some studies, and how we can encourage patients to not only obtain screening, but also to obtain uh, that critical follow-up in-person eye care when needed will also be an important area of continuing research as well. That's very true. And for, you know, we have the technology, but do people use it? You know, they say that it takes 17 years sometimes to take a evidence-based practice and actually get it implemented into actual use and daily use. So this is a great challenge. So I know you're doing great research in this field and you're leading a lot of efforts nationally in this. Can you explain a little bit about your research and how it applies to teleophthalmology and its adoption in the United States? Sure. So we've uh, been able to leverage uh, the field of implementation science, uh, which is focused on taking evidence-based practices and getting them into uh, daily use. And so what we did was we tried to better understand um, what makes it harder and what makes it easier for patients and primary care providers uh, to use teleophthalmology. And so we interviewed them and we identified uh, one of our findings was that the lack of integration of this technology into primary care workflows uh, was a major barrier to achieving and sustaining uh, effectiveness in increasing diabetic eye screening. Uh, there were quite a few um, patient uh, barriers that included just being unfamiliar with teleophthalmology. Many patients uh, and many providers had never heard about it. Um, patients um, sometimes have misconceptions about diabetic eye screening, as we talked about earlier, related to uh, getting their glasses checked. And there are always logistical challenges for patients, such as cost, time, and transportation. So convenience, as I uh, talked about earlier, is a major factor. Um, another important patient factor is leveraging their trust in their primary care provider. And most patients, um, when we ask them, well, why did you get uh, your eye screening, they said that it was strongly recommended to them by their primary care providers. So that recommendation is really critical. Uh, for primary care providers um, who are referring patients for this, uh, for teleophthalmology, they had a really hard time knowing when their patients are due for screening. Um, a lot of us, uh, as we know, um, may not do the best job of uh, CCing uh, primary care providers when we do a dilated on exam on a patient with diabetes. Um, and so a lot of times the primary care providers do not have records of when the patient last uh, attained screening. Um, and for the primary care providers, um, they really understood the importance of this technology, but um, what made it hard for them was just logistical issues related to how easy it was to um, put in an order or refer the patient for uh, screening um, for teleophthalmology and also getting those screening results. Um, so based on the, uh, the work that we've done um, with these interviews, we developed uh, a implementation program um, called EyeSight, or Implementation for Sustained Impact in Teleophthalmology. Um, we uh, worked with uh, these uh, important clinical stakeholders and patients to figure out how we can best overcome the barriers that we identified to promote more widespread teleophthalmology use, increase screening rates, and reduce preventable vision loss. Uh, in this program, uh, it's a coach-facilitated um, uh, system in which a trained practice facilitator guides primary care providers, staff, and administrators through a process by which they would tailor uh, the implementation of teleophthalmology to their clinic's unique needs and resources. And uh, we have a freely available toolkit online at uh, https uh, slash slash hipexchange.org uh, slash eyesight. Um, that's capital I dash S-I-T-E. And uh, um, hope that uh, some folks can check that out. 
Um, we did test this, and in our pilot study published in the journal Telemedicine and eHealth, we found that eyesight increased to ophthalmology use over sixfold, and diabetic eye screening uh, increased from a baseline of 47% in a rural health uh, system, um, a federally qualified health center, to 64% uh, following the introduction of teleophthalmology. And um, this was a clinically significant improvement um, uh, from performing below the national average to within the top quartile of health systems nationwide. And our next step is to determine whether eyesight is an effective generalizable strategy across multiple rural health systems in a multi-center randomized uh, clinical control trial. And our long-term goal is to expand eye care access in underserved populations using teleophthalmology and hope that what we learn will save sight in our communities here in the U.S. and around the world. Wow, that's very laudable, and uh, that's great that you achieved so much success so far with this, uh, especially in the rural uh, areas. Now, do you have a, uh, uh, any um, indication or interest to expand this to urban areas as well, where there's a larger percentage of diabetes? Yeah, so we are currently looking at um, working uh, with some underserved urban communities, um, particularly communities of color. Um, and, and I think our next step will be to work with some uh, folks in Milwaukee to look at what are some of the unique uh, barriers and facilitators in the African-American community. Um, it's, uh, uh, interestingly, uh, African-Americans are uh, twice as likely to go blind uh, as uh, non-Hispanic white population. So it's definitely an area that we are very much interested in. That's wonderful, especially health equity has uh, really been a, a thing of note in this day and era. And I'm really happy that this type of technology can really make an impact and really expand access to all cadres of people. So that's that's great. Um, one of the things that, you know, is important to note in any technology is looking at the champions or the drivers of such technology. I know that insurers are very interested in such technology because they're graded, you know, by the rates. Uh, the quality metrics in their population and having an eye exam and if you're a patient who has diabetes is a, a very key metric in the quality of their care. Uh, who have been the stakeholders or the drivers for pushing teleophthalmology and trying to get it established in clinics? Well, there are a lot of stakeholders involved, um, as you mentioned, and I can't speak for all of them. I think obviously patients and their families stand to gain the most from having greater access to and more options for obtaining vision-saving eye care. Um, I've seen many uh, champions in the primary care realm, um, primary care providers, uh, some of whom who have actually set up programs uh, on their own accord. Um, obviously, eye care providers uh, like ourselves, um, who are very interested in expanding uh, access to eye care and public health, um, are also major champions. And um, I'm hopeful that more of our advocacy organizations will increase their support for policies that will help further increase adoption and facilitate greater teleophthalmology use. Now, are there any people who uh, sort of uh, put up roadblocks to making this happen? I don't know, some of our own colleagues, uh, you know, are looking to see that this is threatening their business. Um, and, uh, I'm sure there's that type of feeling as well in some areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, one of the issues has been um, with some eye care providers feeling that, um, you know, that this is going to somehow reduce the number of patients who see them, um, that the patients would rather uh, have teleophthalmology than come in for in-person care. Um, what I say to those folks is that, you know, right now, uh, many of us, I would say the vast majority of eye care providers are quite overwhelmed with the number of patients that we, uh, we need to see. And um, when yet we're only seeing about half of the patients with diabetes who need care. And so I think it's, it's unrealistic uh, if you look at the, the population uh, with diabetes here in the U.S. and how that's continuing to increase. It's supposed to double or triple within the next few decades um, with no concurrent increase in eye care providers that there really just aren't enough eye care providers, period, to screen all of these patients. Um, furthermore, there have been quite a few studies showing that once you set up a teleophthalmology program, you actually increase the volume <clears throat> that um, downstream eye care providers uh, do see uh, with patients needing uh, cataract surgery, people needing um, surveillance for uh, glaucoma, 
development, uh, as well as diabetic eye disease um, and macular degeneration. These are often patients that none of us are seeing, um, and yet they are going blind in our communities. So I think as an eye care provider, um, you know, for me personally, I've just seen far too many patients um, lose their vision unnecessarily just simply due to lack of access to uh, eye care. So I think um, there, there are many patients that none of us are seeing, and so um, the more that we can expand access, I think the better uh, it will be for, for all of us and for our communities. So it's the rising tide lifts all ships, and I think that's very true. Uh, so yes, the perspective has to kind of be more expansive, and I, I agree with you. We're, we're, we're both part of the same choir there. So now, you know, with anything, uh, money is always a, a big factor in things, and although you said money and cost wasn't a, a big factor in adopting such technology, often it is uh, there in sustaining t this technology or sustaining this uh, intervention in practices. So what are the current thoughts and recommendations about financial sustaining teleophthalmology, especially as it relates to improving the HEDIS metric for annual diabetic eye exams in patients? Sure. Um, so uh, obviously it's, it's very complicated the way that health systems are reimbursed and all of the different uh, population health uh, measures that uh, they can achieve bonuses for. So what we recommend is to work closely with administrators at each health system, particularly population health and quality improvement directors, um, as well as experienced billing and compliance staff. These folks can be really critical for ensuring the development of a financial model that works within the unique factors and constraints of their local environment. Um, these include uh, factors such as payer mix, regional differences in Medicare and Medicaid, reimbursement for teleophthalmology and uh, overall ensuring strong alignment with organizational goals and initi existing initiatives can also be really important for obtaining buy-in from top health system leadership. So trying to uh, get your team on board and, and have these diverse uh, people in your health system or the health system you're working with, with on your team is very, very important. Yeah. Uh, how, how have your, your experience been in that? Have you engaged them early on in the process, or when is the best time to contact these people when you're looking at teleophthalmology? Uh, I think it's really important um, from the beginning to really get um, buy-in from senior leadership. I think it's really hard, especially with a complex program like teleophthalmology, where you need primary care, you need uh, eye care uh, special specialists, um, uh, sometimes you need uh, non-primary care or eye care. For example, um, some of our cameras are operated by radiology technicians, and mm -hmm. so we actually had to get radiology managers uh, on board uh, about this project. Um, so I think you know as early on as possible in terms of engaging all of these stakeholders within the health system um, to get buy-in. And um, going back to what you said about champions, it's really important to um, reach out to people early on um, because you never know who's going to be your champion. Uh, one surprise we had early on was that one of the managers in radiology was uh, a long-term supporter of the local Lions Club. So she really understood from in a very fundamental way why this work was so important. And um, I think finding those people who will um, help uh, uh, remove obstacles um, is as important as finding the the right people who um, will you know give you the green light for for what you're doing. That's so true. You never know who's going to be your supporter. You just got to keep uh, giving the message to everyone and see uh, who comes on board. So that's great. Now, I know the technology is advancing. You know, we talked about cameras improving and, you know, developing the framework and, and, uh, and plugging in the technology as it comes. Now, there's new technology, including artificial intelligence, that are becoming more of game changers in this space. Uh, can you speak a little bit about that? And how do you think that will impact what we're doing here? Because as of right now, uh, humans are still reading many of these images, but as technology evolves, that might not be the case. Well, artificial intelligence represents a tremendous advance, as you know, and has incredible potential for increasing access to teleophthalmology by expanding the pool uh, of folks who um, provide image interpretations. 
the accuracy and reproducibility of these algorithms for detecting diabetic eye disease in retinal photographs have been well validated. However, there remains room for improvement, particularly with regards to improving image gradeability and sensitivity for non-diabetic eye disease through the development of new algorithms and improved te camera technology. In addition, more research needs to be done regarding patient acceptance and ethical issues regarding the use of artificial intelligence. We look forward to continued advancements in this area, which will provide eye care providers with advanced tools for clinical decision support and provide patients with individually tailored assessment of risks for disease progression and their likely treatment outcomes. That's uh, you know, wonderful to hear, you know, that uh, we, we in ophthalmology aren't scared of technology, uh, may some other people may be. We, we embrace technology in a lot of what we do in our own clinics for our own patients. And so it's great to see that you know, we can find a way to harness technology while making sure that it is safely used for our patients and really uh, helps our patients rather than just, uh, you know, uh, being a cool thing to do. So that that's great. Now, one of the things about telling ophthalmology is that it is a screening service essentially it's evaluation and we're not really providing care uh, through these services um, so still when you identify disease the patients do need to see an eye care provider and often a specialist in eye care a specialized ophthalmologist like you and I how do we look at that and look at the follow-up rates uh, for these patients back into eye care are the patients um, more apt to follow up after for getting such a screening, or is there still some challenges in that area? Well, I think follow-up after screening is always going to be a challenge because fundamentally we're reaching out to patients who don't already have an existing relationship with an eye care provider. And oftentimes, if you're talking about patients with diabetes, um, they're already these are the people who are most reluctant to come in person. Um, I will say that in our experience in the programs that we've worked with, um, we've had pretty good success. Um, we've had, uh, you know, somewhere upwards of 70% or more of patients follow up, depending on which program we're talking about. Um, and I think, again, reducing those barriers, cost, uh, convenience, um, transportation, not only through telemedicine, but also for the follow-up care, I think is really important so that patients can feel really confident um, going in that they're not going to have any surprise costs attached um, to their care um, and also leveraging the trust of their primary care provider and telling them that this is really important. Um, I will say that for most patients, when you tell them, you know, a primary care provider says, well, I think you should get an eye exam because you have diabetes, it's relatively different than saying, you know, not only should you get an eye exam in person because of diabetes, but also we found something abnormal on your photo. I think that gets people's attention a lot, a lot more than just a general blanket recommendation. Right, so people actually know that they have something concerning going on in their eye and they need some further uh, workup and some further analysis there. So that's great. I think that really empowers patients to take the ownership of their condition, hopefully, and uh, get some more help. And as we guide them as providers, that, that's wonderful. Now, one of the cool things is that, you know, you're working with primary care, you're working with diabetes in general. So, you know, it's, it's really expanding beyond just eye care and cataracts and glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy, all these things are related directly to the eye. Um, what can advocacy groups do, such as Vision 2020? You know, vision, eye care is just a one little cog in the whole body. You know, there's so many other things uh, that can go on in the body, so many other diseases that are out there. How do we sort of band and form these alliances and kind of move forward to push technologies like teleophthalmology and uh, telemedicine forward as a group? Well, I think organizations like Vision 2020 that have so many great relationships with, uh, with larger groups um, can really work together in finding common ground um, and uh, in increasing uh, advocacy around improving reimbursement um, and regulatory issues uh, will really be important for uh, educating policymakers and patients to take collective action to increase tele adoption. 
That's very well put. How about um, in terms of looking at disease as, a, as an entity that affects the patient holistically in a way? So what's happening in your eye, I often tell patients that it's also happening in your kidneys, it's happening in the small vessels in your brain and other areas. Is, is there um, any um, a benefit for the eye care provider to uh, you know, champion uh, with uh, endocrinologist or primary care provider um, about the, the global aspect or the holistic aspect of diabetes or other diseases that manifest in the eye but have other systemic complications as well? Yeah, I think really what teleophthalmology promotes is a greater um, uh, kind of communication and um, trying to work together in a larger initiative on behalf of the patient. I think Oftentimes, as eye care providers, we come, become somewhat siloed from the rest of uh, the medical um, profession. And um, as you know very well in your practice as a retina specialist, when a patient has advanced uh, diabetic eye disease, uh, advanced diabetic retinopathy, that's really uh, the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's going on throughout the rest of their body. And so I think um, some of the data coming out now in terms of morbidity and mortality uh, uh, for these patients has been really quite um, dramatic. And I think uh, it'll be important to um, increase the coordination of care across multiple specialties to try to uh, maximize outcomes for these patients. That's a great point because patients don't come in with just an eye and a foot and a kidney. They're the whole body. They walk in and, you know, another doctor's appointment is, oh, we just think it's another appointment for us. But for them, it's like their 10th appointment. They, they really don't need that. So trying to be more efficient in your care uh, would be very, very helpful and sort of trying to get you know, a thousand patients into ophthalmology or optometry to try to get care. If you can have teleophthalmology screen these patients essentially and triage these patients so that they can, the, those who are more urgent and have some pressing needs can come in early, I think um, would be the way to go so that we're overloading our limited system. So this is wonderful yeah. that you know you've really pioneered this in, 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 in your area and, and really pushing it forward nationally, it's great. Well, thanks a lot, Rajiv. I really appreciate, uh, you know, all these great questions and a great discussion. Definitely. Yeah. And I, last thing is, if there's one thing, one pressing thing right now that Vision 2020 and others could do for you and, and to your program or for teleophthalmology in general, what would that be? I'd say right now, I think supporting legislation that uh, further allows for the continuation of a lot of the uh, reimbursement and regulatory um, changes that have been made related to the COVID-19 pandemic and extending those long term, I think will be really important in terms of um, substantially uh, further supporting the growth and development of uh, telemedicine in general, as well as teleophthalmology. Well put. So we should uh, write our congressmen and senators and make sure that uh, we're getting the message out there and also push for advocacy probably through the American Academy of Ophthalmology and the American Academy of uh, Optometry, the American Optometric Association and others to, to really push this agenda forward nationally and maybe even work with other folks uh, in the non-eye care fields like the American Diabetes Association and uh, primary care groups and public health groups because it is a public health issue. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Yeah, well, thank you so much for being with us and, and talking about ophthalmology. Good luck to your program, and I look forward to keep working with you and learning from you, and, and hopefully we can really make this a, a national effort and join the international colleagues that we have in trying to make an impact uh, for folks with uh, issues that affect their eyes. Well, likewise, and thanks for all you do, too. So I'm just uh, really honored to um, be invited today and uh, uh, look forward to continuing to work on this. Great, wonderful. Well, thanks for having us to, uh, today and then thanks for being with us. And uh, we look forward to speaking more about your successes in the future. Thank you.